just log in and people should be joining. That's awesome. Well, maybe you should share the start screen. Can I use a pointer? All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, STEM Cell 2021 speaker series. My name is Telmo Diaz. I'm a PhD student at the University of New Mexico for Dr. Carol and Dr. Lopez Lab. And we have uh, two very interesting talks today by Dr. Felipe Garcia Quiroz and Dr. Cesar Rodriguez Emenegger. Um, remember that this is also streamed on YouTube. So if you want to access later to the content that today is going to be live stream, you're going to be able to do so. Uh, if you are joining by Zoom, please uh, submit your questions in the Q&A section. And if you are joining by YouTube, you can use the comment section and we will transmit the questions to the moderator. So first of all, we have uh, Dr. Felipe Garcia Quiroz, who, who was trained as a biomedical engineer in his native Colombia to later go to Duke University and obtain his PhD from the lab of Asutosh Chakori. He focused on his uh, research about self-assembling uh, protein for biomedical applications. A very important outcome of his PhD was the elucidation of sequence rules that rationalize the ability of intrinsically disordered proteins to form membraneless organelles in the cell. And after his uh, PhD work, he moved to the laboratory of Elaine Fuchs to, at uh, Rockefeller University, where he did a postdoctoral uh, fellow, uh, when uh, that led to the discovery of a genetic repeat proteins in the skin assembly, a surprisingly extensive network of membraneless organelles with unique liquid-liquid properties that are crucial to the protein process of skin barrier formation. Felipe is the recipient of a career award at the Scientific Interface from Borough Welcome. And he is now an assistant professor at the Georgia Tech and Emory University. He has his own lab and his research engineers selfish assembling materials that are genetically encoded and stimulate responses. He uses his uh, research to challenge uh, some uh, features in the fields of nanotechnology, biotechnology and medicine. And his results uh, illuminate fundamental aspects of biology that serve as foundation to engineer advanced biomaterials. And we thank uh, Dr. Kiros to be here with us today. And thank you for being very active in our uh, speaker series. So I'm going to let you share the screen now and take over. Thank you, Telmo. Do you see my screen? Yes, all good. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. And my team is fascinated by similarly disordered proteins that over space and time form very defined structures in the cell. And so I'll be talking about these membranes and similar responsive organelles. But we have a deep interest in self-assembly in general, uh, particularly again, thinking about disordered proteins or IDPs. And if you look at the molecular level, you always see a different picture for these kinds of IDPs, which is unlike the kinds of rigid structures that we typically think of when we think of proteins like helices. And so we, over the years, we've done a lot of work uh, looking at how to map the sequence space to understand fundamental principles of how, about how these proteins behave, particularly in the context of how these proteins then self-assemble into structures like the nano rods shot in this image. And so generally we're thinking about, again, a transition from a soluble state of these IDPs in a similar responsive manner into some sort of aggregate or compartment. And, more recently, we've been thinking about this process uh, in the context of cells and tissues. And the examples that I'll be showing you uh, today are all really inspiring our work in the concept of the skin where we just demonstrated that these phase separation processes happen in the cells of the skin and are very important for the formation of, this, uh, of, of the skin barrier. So what is going on in the cell then? 
So you can think of the cell, of course, as, as a mixture of proteins, but if one of these proteins has the to undergo any of these kinds of phase transitions, uh, if the conditions are met, one of these proteins, proteins with the mix from that complex mixture forming its own compartment, even without the need for a membrane. And so you can map that to a phase diagram as you would in polymer physics. And so you have protein concentration and, and a given temperature or some sort of stimuli, but if the conditions are met and you pass that critical concentration for a given temperature, the system will then mix into a high density phase forming the, the, the scaffold, the core of that organelle and a low density phase that would be sort of what's left in the cytoplasm. So this polymer physics framework gives us a, a way to begin to look at, at these kinds of organelles. But they're coming of age. Uh, for a long time, of course, we learned the cell is made of membrane bound organelles, but for a long time we've known that things like the nucleolus are, you know, are, are there and they don't have a membrane. But over the last decade, there's been an explosion of examples of very intriguing organelles that are membraneless that have interesting biological functions. And here's just a list of examples all the way from RNA processing to chromatin organization. And more recently in the context of tissue biology, so multicellular uh, structures where tangential assembly is being shown to be uh, related to phase separation behaviors. And in our own work, as I'll show you, skin barrier formation. And as we learn more about these kinds of organelles, now there's opportunities for engineering them. And my favorite example, and, and there are not that many yet, but my favorite so far is, is one in which uh, uh, the group of Edward Lemke in Mainz, Germany, uh, create an organelle for orthogonal translation in the cell. Beautiful example, here's a citation. So what are these properties then that can be controlled uh, by phase separation? And so you can think of, of any of these proteins, of course, as, as subject to post translational modifications in the cell. And if one of these modifications favors interactions, then you can drive assembly of these organelles. Likewise, and conversely, if you have an organelle and there are post translational modifications that counter any of these interactions, then you have this assembly. And because these are very dynamic interactions controlled by these phase separation dynamics, they're kind of basically liquids. And so depending on their viscosity, if any of these condensates in the cell in the cytoplasm would meet, they can readily fuse and this would depend on the viscosity of these structures. But also you might have different kinds of, of condensates or membranous organelles and, and their relationship as they meet will depend on their surface tension and their affinities um, so that they might either fuse forming a new organelle or they might actually remain as distinct organelles. But the view that I just offered is, is one that is kind of dominated by polymer physics. It's very homotypic. You have, it's almost like thinking as the cell as, as, as a test tube where you only have one protein that undergoes these kinds of phase transitions. However, of course, the milieu in the cell is much more complex than that. And so you can immediately begin to think of even just three examples, three proteins that are multivalent and have an interesting interactum where they have different affinities for each other. And the work of Mike Rosen and others has, uh, I think, made an important contribution demonstrating that Beyond IDPs, if you really just think about multivalent interactions, any of these scaffolds, if they meet a multivalent scaffold for which they have an affinity, they can potently drive to the formation of membranous organelles. But because these organelles have binding sites available for other proteins to join, these so-called low valency clients might get recruited to the membranous organelles, adding functionality to them. And so it serves as a framework to think of, of these membranous organelles as having scaffolds, those that drive assembly and maintenance of the organelle, and clients, those that are just there uh, to add functionality. So with that in mind, I wanna, I wanna sort of pause for a little bit and tell you then what I wanna talk about for this talk. And so of course I wanna inspire you as a community thinking about synthetic cells about how these membranous organelles might be important to your work. And so I wanna discuss aspects of their assembly or disassembly, particularly how it's governed by phase separation dynamics. How might even uh, the crowding of the intracellular space might be possible with these kinds of organelles that are supposedly essentially prone to fusion, uh, what their stimuli responsiveness is like. And, and importantly, as we think of any organelle, you gotta control its functionality and composition. So I wanna show you examples of how we can rarely control and target components to these organelles. Uh, what kinds of mechanisms can be actuated by these sort of uh, membranous organelles. And, and lastly, I wanna touch briefly on our own efforts to think about how we can engineer uh, these sorts of membranous organelles. I'm gonna accomplish this hopefully by telling you about one system. And so that system is, as I said earlier, is our own work in, in skin biology. So I, I need to introduce the system first. So here's the skin, it's a multicellular structure. So follow me here. It's, uh, we begin with stem cells at the bottom and they're bound to some extracellular matrix, a basement membrane, and they differentiate by moving upwards. And so they move upwards and as they do so, they acquire new proteins and so new unique structures, and particularly 
right below the skin surface, there's a layer called the granule layer. And it's called granular because of these red granules that are called keratohaline granules. And they've been known for a hundred years, but we knew very little about them. But to us, now with this new lens of phase separation of membranous organelles, like, oh, well, this may be really intriguing and put into suit ep epidermal membranous organelles. And so we began to ask questions about, okay, well, what are these structures like? Are they liquid-like as one would expect, or are they solid? How are they interacting with the nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles? Again, there is an intriguing transition that has to happen for the skin to form, which is that this normal looking cell having a nuclear mitochondria and others has to lose those membrane-bound organelles to form this so-called dead surface uh, of, of the skin. And so how is keratohaline granule disassembly perhaps contributing to that process? These were the kinds of questions that were really driving a lot of our thoughts at the time. But as you'll see, and hopefully I convince you, this provides an interesting framework to understand how membranous organelles function and how we might engineer them uh, for synthetic cells. We had a clue, and this is how the story begins. Uh, we knew that a protein known as FLG or filagrin uh, was abundant in those structures. And so here is just an immunofluorescence image of mouse skin showing the localization of that protein very abundant uh, in the skin of the mouse and always localized to those particular granules. So what is this filagrin? And when, when we looked at it, it was obvious. It was a prototypical phase transition IDP. And so let me walk you through it. It's an intrinsically disordered protein made of multiple repeats. And I know that it's intrinsically disordered, but I can show it to you with the disorder plot. Zero is ordered, one is disordered. And so you can see the entire length of this gigantic protein is essentially at one, so disordered. Uh, except for the S100 domain, this blue domain at the end terminus, it's a dimerization domain. But if you actually look at the specific composition of that protein is, is so-called low complexity because only a handful of amino acids make most of its composition, particularly histidine, serine, and glycine, which we knew were important for phase separation behavior. And then if you look at its size, these are among the largest proteins in the human and the mouse proteome, which we knew was important for multivalency. And then when we look even closer, some of the unique features of this protein, like the fact that it would never have a lysine, but rather prefer an arginine, was a sequence bias that we know was important for phase separation. So again, all pointing to prototypical phase separation behavior. Now, if you actually look at these repeats, uh, they're identical almost, 95 to 99% identical in composition, in sequence. And so we began by basically taking a given repeat, because they're essentially all identical, and begin, began to build constructs with different number of repeats to probe this phase separation behavior in the intracellular space. And at any time throughout this assembly process, we could add fluorescent proteins, we could add different domains to begin to probe the functionality of these proteins. Let me just give you an example. So this is a fixed concentration. And here I have two constructs, one with two repeats of, 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 of the RA domain. And you can see the protein is essentially diffused in the cytoplasm. But for the N equal eight, so eight copies of the repeat, now you see very well-defined formation of what appear to be membranous organelles. And then we did this quantitatively over a wide range of expression levels. And so here's the quantification where for N equal one or two, it doesn't matter how much you make in the cell, it doesn't undergo phase separation. But for four, eight, and 12, you begin to see sharper and sharper phase transitions so that for full length, uh, we estimated that about one micromolar is sufficient to trigger a, a, a very well-defined uh, phase transition inside the cell. Now, how about the liquid-like behaviors, however? And we can probe this using photobleaching. And so here is one of these compartments in the cell and we can photobleach it. And just 13 seconds later, there is recovery. If you quantify that, so photobleaching happens, you lose fluorescence, there's recovery is very fast and complete. Now, of course, this will depend on the size of these proteins. And so as these proteins get smaller, you also see that the recovery is happening faster. So the liquid dynamics are changing. Nonetheless, they remain very liquid. Now, if you do live imaging uh, of cells in culture, you begin to see that over time, when these organelles meet each other, they undergo liquid-like fusion events, the drop, like droplets of water that are coming together. Now, this is cool and in line with what pretty much everyone has seen in the context of membranous organelles, but to us, it was like, wait a second, this is not maybe so cool because if you remember from earlier, in the context of the epidermis, these organelles appear to be crowded in the cytoplasm. So if they're liquid-like and we now see that they do undergo liquid-like fusion, what is going on in the epidermis? How is that happening? And that was also cool to us and to me particularly because I knew that it was telling us something about a challenge that we would have when engineering membranes organelles, which is that you may not be interested in having one 
single organelle, you may want to have many co uh, coexisting. And so perhaps there's a solution that is offered by epidermis. And I'll show you our efforts to uncover this. But to do this, I need to tell you what we did to then examine the endogenous organelles in the skin. And so instead of building our own engineer organelles, we wanted to actually look at the ones in the skin. And so to do that, we thought, well, why don't we just target something that is some sort of fluorescent sensor to those endogenous organelles to be able to study them. And the rationale was very simple. Well, if you were to regulate a protein that undergoes phase separation in the cell, like filaggrin, it would clearly form its own compartments. But I would like to have a sensor that is already present in the cell and that if experience in the presence of this other phase separation protein that it would then report on that phase separation behavior. And the rationale was very simple. IDPs with sufficiently weak and phase separation specific interactions should be able to report phase separation behavior. That was the rationale. So let me show you how it works. I already told you that one repeat from the is not good enough to drive phase separation behavior. So what you can do is you can tag it, right, with, with just GFP, for example, and then co-express it with filagrin. And so I'm going to show you what that looks like. So here's a cell that has filagrin, so it forms condenses really well. And here is the you know, putative sensor. And you can see that it does show the localization of the filagrin. So the condenses are, are shown, but the partition coefficient, and, and I'll be using this consistently as P, the partition coefficient is just too full. So it's just too full and rich in the condensate. It's not really that great. So we began tuning the specificity of these interactions to enhance them while at the same time playing with different domains that we know would also affect this phase separation behavior. I ended up keeping the story short, two sensors, two sensor designs that are very different and actually unlike the filagrin sequence and among themselves are also very different. And let me just show you what it looks like. So again, here's a cell that co-expresses filagrin forms condensates or, or this apparent membranous organelles, but the sensor is also expressed. And you can see now that the partition coefficient is very high, about 25. So it goes, exquisitely well into those organelles, unlike the first design. So now we have a tool that seems to be targeted really, really well and efficiently to the organelles. Of course, I need to show you a control, which is that if filagri is not present, these sensors do not form compartments of their own. So these sensors are indeed soluble in the cell and only upon the presence of this phase separation protein show and report on that phase separation behavior. So with this tool, uh, being a genetically encoded tool, we could put it and package it into lentiviral vectors. And these lentiviral vectors can, you know, express our constructs, these phase separation sensors under the control of a given promoter of interest. And we can also play additional tricks like adding uh, herpin RNAs to knock down any protein of interest. And, and, and I won't show you a lot of examples of this um, because of time, but uh, it's a tool that we use extensively in our studies. But this is more or less what it looks like. Uh, you create these, you know, uh, you inject these viruses in utero and are able to very quickly create these genetically engineered mice so that the surface uh, of these mice, their skin is tagged with this uh, fluorescent proteins. And as I'll show you later, this basically allows us to then begin to look at these phase separation dynamics in the skin directly. And so this is a cross section of what the skin looks like. Again, base layer all the way to the corneum, as I showed you earlier. And if you look at the signal from the sensors, you see that the, there is granularity appearing as you move towards the top, the top being the cornea, right? Where the granules uh, would be expected to be uh, seen. But if you now look at planar views, uh, you now see something really remarkable, which is that in the early granular cells, you have very few of these granules and they're very small. But as you move towards the surface through the middle and late granular layers, you begin to see very large granules. Consistent again with what we had seen actually just from immunofluorescence. Uh, so the sensors seem to be showing us what we, what, what we wanted to see. But how about the dynamics? This is of course, you know, something that we can do through live imaging. And what we saw, again, to our surprise, but consistent with the immunofluorescence is that over the span of about a day, if you do imaging of the, of the skin of these mice, there's a lot of growth of these granules, but there's no fusion. They're grown without fusion. And we can quantify this and so if you look you know, from zero to 800 minutes, there's a lot of growth. You see that new granules, emer new, new compartments emerge, some grew in volume. In fact, if you quantify this, some of them are growing by about tenfold in volume. So a lot of growth, but no fusion. And so to us, this was, this was really puzzling because you know, what was going on? Maybe these catalytic granules in the pyramids are not liquid like we thought from our in vitro experiments. And so one thing that we can do, of course, is photo bleaching again. And so we can take these sensors and we can photo bleach them and you can see that in 2.5 seconds, there's recovery. And this is sensor A, but this is now sensor B. And we basically see the same. This is the quantification on the right. 
within two, three seconds, there is recovery, right? So these, these compartments are mixing their components very rapidly, indicative of, of a liquid-like behavior. So what is going on there? And so this forces us to go back because in our initial experiments, when we did the experiments in vitro that I showed you earlier with extensive fusion, um, we were working with a cell that was unlike the cells in the epidermis. And one major characteristic of the cells in the epidermis, particularly in the granular layer, is that they have acquired keratins that are very specific to that stage of differentiation. So we went back and we thought, well, maybe this cytoskeletal network that is made by the keratins in the epidermis is somehow, you know, adding an additional layer of structure to the cells that prevents fusion. And so we created these engineering cells that will have filaggin compartments, but also expression of a fluorescent label keratin that's specific to a granular layer. And we began seeing that whenever we would see any uh, keratohyalin granule, we would also see cages. It would seem just like the keratin was kind of surrounding right nicely these structures. And we would, when we then uh, did live imaging experiments, we would see that you know, in regions of the cell with very low keratin content, you would actually see nicely uh, emergence or fusion of these uh, compartments of these filaggin granules. But there would be regions of the cell with lots of keratin in which again, the granules were kind of embedded in this keratin network. And then we wouldn't see fusion unless they would detach from the keratin network. And in even more striking examples, we would see cases where we would see two granules that are adjacent to each other but there is like a thick fiber in between them that is acting as a fence. And then we will never see fusion. And this is best actually seen with an optical section. So now you see this basically two closely interacting granules. We never see fusion, but now we understand there is a fence in between them that is preventing that fusion. So that, that forces to rethink a little bit of the keratin part. And so here is the structure of keratins and particularly human keratin 10, which again, is a very abundant in the granular layer of the epidermis. And one part that is poorly understood about these keratins is they actually have N and C-terminal IDP domains. So we thought, well, maybe these IDP domains are interacting with, with the granules and with filaggin. And so we created uh, an in vitro experiment in, in cell culture where we could create granules. And you can see that M. cherry, for instance, is, is very well excluded uh, from these um, filaggin granules. The enrichment is actually 0.4. So it's, it's, it's really not enriched at all. It's actually excluded. But if you add the IDP domains, the N terminal IDP domains from keratin to M-cherry, now they go into the compartment. Now the enrichment is about 1.6. So the N terminal domain for keratin 10 from the experiment we concluded is actually allowing for interaction with the filaggin and the condensates. And so to keep the story short, what we ended up doing was going back to the pyramids and creating genetically engineered mice with fluorescently tagged keratins. And it allows us to visualize the, the maturation of the keratin network in conjunction with the maturation of the granules. And we saw consistently that the crowding with keratin granules was hand in hand with keratin bundling. So that by the mature granular stage, you would actually have a very mature keratin network surrounding the keratin granules. And this is well seen in this cross section on the top, on the right of this image, where you see that the granules are in fact embedded in keratin cages. And so the keratin network is in attack of war with the keratohyalin granules to allow for this massive structuring and crowding of the cytoplasm that we see in the epidermis. Now, of course, you know, we, wanted, we wanted to know the functionality of these structures. Uh, and this gets to the stimulus responsiveness, and you'll see that in a bit. But essentially, I want to go back to the epidermis. And so I told you that one of the intriguing things about the epidermis is that when you go from this layer in the granular state to the corneum, the surface of the skin, the cells change dramatically, right? They have to lose their nuclei, they have to lose their mitochondria and organelles, and they do that very rapidly. We, in our experiments, we saw this happens in about two hours. So very rapid process, poorly understood. Could it be that the keratin grounds are playing a role? So we began doing Im imaging experiments where we combined imaging of chromatin and imaging of our sensors to mark these keratin granules. And we consistently saw beautiful coordination of the process of compaction of the chromatin, which is the initial stage of enucleation, with the disassembly, a partial disassembly of the keratohyalin granules. And we, with experiments that I don't really have time to show you, we demonstrated that that's critical for the process of enucleation. But what I do want to show you is that a stream of this keratohyalin granule disassembly and enucleation is a beautiful example of stimulant responsiveness in membranous organelles. So we knew that the surface of the skin was acidic. And this is well known for a long time. Your, your skin is about 5.5 on the surface. But that's extracellular pH. We, of course, are dealing with intracellular organelles. And so we thought, well, maybe there is a transition somehow 
around the granular layer uh, that maybe there is a sort of pH around 6.5. We know that in the basal layer, this is normalizing to 7.4. But intriguingly, if there is transition in that pH gradient, this is interesting because filaggrin is a histidine-rich protein and histidines have a pK of about 6.1. And we knew that would add to our phase separation behavior. So we began doing experiments in vitro where we would co-express filaggrin to form condenses in cell culture together with sensors. And so you can see this perfect co-localization of the two, that's why they look white. Um, but if you change it to cellular pH now to 6.2, um, now you go from beautiful co-localization in granule one, granule two, to partial disassembly of the granules. Uh, this is seen in the magenta signal for filaggrin, and then in the red, in the green signal for the sensor. So there is a pH actuated disassembly of the granules that allows for the release of these components from within them. And we know that this is specific to the pKa of histidine because when we did experiments at different pH values, it's only once you go down to about pH 6.3 that you begin to see prominent release of the filaggrin signal. And suddenly, if you keep going down to more acidic values, you actually get more prominent in this assembly. So uh, we thought this was a really cool example of an actuated process in a pH responsive manner to trigger disassembly of membranous organelles. And I don't have time to show you how we went back to in vivo to demonstrate this process in the context of the pyramids, but I want to kind of summarize what we found. So this is kind of an overview of what the skin looks like from the perspective of phase separation. And so early on, you know, when the granules first appear, uh, there are very few keratins there. So, you know, when granules meet, they do undergo fusion. We see examples of that in, the, in our live imaging experiments. But once you get to the middle granule layer, there is crowding that begins to happen because the keratins are forming cages around these granules. And as they do so over the span of about one or two days, these granules grow substantially as the keratins also bundle. When they get to the critical stage, like this example of this cell that is about to, to transition to a corneum, there's a massive disassembly process that happens that is, as I showed you earlier, pH trigger. And what we now know that happens is that this, this intracellular pH shift is again leading to disassembly of the granules, triggering compaction, and completing that process leading to the formation of early cells in the corneum, these so-called squames. And so what I'm not showing you, however, is that if you remove these compartments, even an intracellular pH shift is not sufficient. So we know that this is a, a character high and ground dependent process, that the sensing of this pH shift is responsible, is done by the scatter and granules, and that there is a prominent release of components from within them that we think are important for enucleation. Uh, there that I have to show you, uh, there are very intriguing interactions between the organelles, uh, these membranous organelles and the membrane-bound organelles, like the nuclei, for instance, we see the formations of those organelles. We know they're important, but we don't know the role in, in detail. And so there are gaps that we still have. Like we don't really know what these clients, these components of the cryptothelium granules that are released in a pH responsive manner to actuate nucleation are still unknown to us. But there are examples, uh, but, but the, this is, these are things that we can um, target in the future. And so I wanna go back briefly to this idea of targeting to, a, to the compartments. And so you might recall that in the context of multivalency, you might have clients that get recruited, right? So if you know a binding domain, you can deal with that. And so let me give you an example. We know that there's an S100 domain, it's a dimerization domain, so we can create that. And we can create a client that has a S100 domain to allow for dimerization. But look at this. It does go into the compartment, but it does it only with a partition coefficient of 1.3. Of course, if you remove the S100 domain, then you have no partition whatsoever. So you can definitely take things to the compartment that way, but it may not be as efficient. Now, you may introduce your own domains of interest. So in this case, we created one that is completely engineered. It's a cleavage side of the tobacco uh, virus protease. And so now you see that with this new domain added, now this uh, protease that is dead at the very end of it can go to a compartment by the partition coefficient remains low. However, it's a specific. If you mutate the cleavage sequence, now that the protease actually does not localize. But I want to put this in context of the phase separation sensors that I alluded to earlier. So again, partition coefficient of this uh, protease, that protease is 2.1. For the, for the sensors that I described earlier, the partition coefficient is about an order of magnitude higher. And importantly, it does not depend on the concentration levels. And so for very low to very high expression levels, you still have a very consistent partition coefficient. And more importantly, because it's not a one-to-one -one binding, you can actually accumulate a lot of these components in those structures. And so much higher amounts within the granules than what you will get with this one-to-one -one binding. And because it's not a one-to-one -one binding, we don't see that the presence of these components within the compartments alter the dynamics. So this is, this is uh, FRAP data for the scaffold filaggrin. When in presence of the sensor, we see that the filaggrin doesn't care. But when you have a client to which this client, uh, to which that binds to the scaffold, now it's 
drag in on the scaffold and we see that the dynamics are altered. And this is because the scaffold, the client actually does bind to the scaffold with sufficient strength. Whereas if you compare that with the sensor, the frap is so fast that it's indicating that the affinity is just really, really low. So you can accomplish beautiful targeting to the compartment despite these extremely weak interactions, which we think is, is remarkable. Now, what do you do with that? And so we began to, to think about restricting reactions to the Ketrohalin granules specifically. And so here's an example, just to give you a proof of concept. And so we're restricting bioaccumulation. So what we're doing here is taking one of these sensors and attaching at the genetic level uh, peroxidase, and this is Apex2. And when you provide a biotin phenol to this reaction, and this is mouse skin, this presence of the sensor now is sufficient to drive biotinylation, but the biotinylation is specific to the compartment. And you can see this from the MERGE image. Now, if you leave out the biotin, this is a biotin phenol, again, you see at the Sertavian labeling, there's no Sertavian label because there's no biotin to label, right? So we're really restricting now this biotinylation reaction specifically to the condensate. That's important to us because this biotinylation can serve as a proximity dependent tool for us to then purify the components that are tagged with biotin to begin to ask who are those endogenous clients that are maybe responsible for the biology and for the functionality of these catecholine granules. Of course, this also shows that we can restrict reactions to these abundant organelles of the epidermis. And I wanna finalize, this is uh, just nearing toward the end of my talk, with the idea that we have a strong interest in engineering synthetic versions of these organelles. Why? Because I didn't have time to show you, but we actually know that this protein, gigantic protein, is heavily mutated in humans. And we actually did a lot of work to show that these mutations, which are nonsense, so truncating mutations, um, they potently prevent assembly of these organelles. And we know that the, uh, and we've been able to link this to skin barrier disorders. So could we shrink this gigantic protein, which is, you know, really not possible to work with in the context of trying to, uh, you know, to rescue this process in, in a realistic setting to a mini filaggin, so a mini version of these proteins. And so this is drawn to a scale basically where we could take one of these domains, so R8, for example, again, and we'll create variants of it that have different phase, phase, phase separation propensities. And we do that in two ways. One is just basically playing with terminalization domains or multi-terminalization domains, in this case, NC1 from collagen 18. But you can also mutate. So there are SNPs in, in, in filaggin that would change from a histine to a tyrosine, which we know would promote phase separation. And so we begin to create variants out in terminalization domains and out in these non-SNPs. And I just give you a flavor for that. If you create trimers of just R8, that's sufficient to drive the assembly of some sort of phase separated compartment in the cell. But they are very low viscosity compartments. And you can see they're basically just flowing in the cytoplasm. But when you go to the other variants that we created, you begin to see very well defined organelles that are actually more reminiscent in viscosity to the endogenous compartments. And, and in data that I didn't have time to show you, we want to tune that viscosity because we know that it's important to the functionality of these structures. And just to give you a, a, a flavor for this, uh, we began to now put these constructs back into the skin. And so we can deplete the skin of the mouse from these endogenous compartments, creating basically a new canvas. And we can now add in our constructs and we can begin to see these engineer organelles in the, in the mouse epidermis. And so we're doing these experiments to basically understand how these engineer organelles might be able to rescue some of the skin barrier defects that we've seen. And so with that, I just wanna sort of wrap up and, and get you thinking about membranous organelles in the context of synthetic cells. And so I hope that you know, from my talk, you get the sense that there are multiple avenues for controlling the composition of these organelles, that even if we're talking about liquid-like behaviors, I mean, they can span a wide range of material properties. And, and, and that phase separation dynamics is basically the framework to, to program the dynamics of these organelles. And because of that, basically, you can think of these organelles as stimulant-responsive compartments, stimulant-responsive materials, in fact. And now thinking about the future, there are a couple of things that I wanna highlight. And so I think the time is right for sure to create designs of membranous organelles for the synthetic cells. We have all the elements required. There's exciting opportunities in the context of multi-phase architectures, like the ones shown here, where now we have liquids within liquids. Uh, and some works, uh, some groups have uh, made progress in that direction. We're very intrigued by multi uh, membranous organelles. Basically, can you have a mixture of these organelles coexisting and so that you assign different functionality to different organelles. And in an area that we're um, really invested in is, is the exploration of non-equilibrium phase separation dynamics. And this is important because 
uh, a lot of examples that we know of are essentially in equilibrium, right? You basically undergo disassembly and assembly in, in what appears to be an equilibrium process. But we know that IDPs and many of the proteins implicated can engage in, in behaviors that are far from equilibrium. And so we think that exploring that avenue uh, will give us a, a new handle into controlling the architecture and controlling the dynamics of these membranes or else in ways that, that uh, could open up uh, interesting avenues for, for new functionality. And so with that, I wanna thank, uh, you know, this, this work that, that goes back to my time at Duke with Toshio Kati, uh, collaborators on NC State. Um, a lot of the work with uh, the epidermis happened in the lab of Elaine Fuchs at Rockefeller University. I'm very thankful for that. And in, in my own group, uh, Alexa Vesija, one of my PhD students contributed uh, to several uh, ideas and, and, and pieces of data in this presentation. So I thank her for that. And I'll take the opportunity to, to advertise. And uh, my group is, is very young and uh, we're actually recruiting. So if there are students there who are interested in postdocs or research scientist positions, please reach out. I would love to, to hear from you. And with that, I'll take questions. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Pierce. That was a beautiful talk. I'm going to go ahead and uh, read you some questions. Uh, the first one from Jacqueline Delora. She says, uh, beautiful work, Felipe, especially the design of the sensors. To clarify, do you expect that the differentiation of the cells found in each skin layer is regulated by the liquid phase separations of filaggrins? Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, this talk, I, I tried to sort of like keep it very light on, on the details of the um, epidermal biology, but we, we invested heavily in linking the phase separation dynamics that we saw and, and the biology. And we see that in, at two different levels. There's a biophysical component, and then there is a biochemical component. The biophysical component is one that relates to a crowding of the cells. So we actually see that because there are so many of these membranous organelles, that ends up being important to the structuring of that uh, cell as it goes towards the skin surface. And, and, we, and we've seen that that's important for the mechanical purpose of the epidermis. Uh, and biochemically, uh, although we don't have the specific clients that are being released to actuate a nucleation, uh, we definitely have seen when we deplete these compartments that there is no pH response in this actuation of a nucleation. And so we, we definitely have shown that it's essential to have these dynamics. So the assembly and disassembly is important. It's not just the formation of the organelle. In this context, it's actually the disassembly that then plays a major role in releasing these key components, which again, as I said, remain to be defined. So we're very excited about the proteomics work uh, to begin to actually parse out the specific components that are responsible for that. But there is definitely links to, between assembly and disassembly and they're biophysical and biochemical. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriel Lopez asked a question. He says, fantastic talk. The changes in microstructure of cells as you go through the, the granular skin layer must affect the cell's mechanical properties. Can you correlate cell mechanical properties to pH in vitro in a way that is relevant to mechanical properties of the skin cellular layers? Mm. That's, that's a really, really cool question, Gabriel. Uh, we've done a, a good, a, a fair amount of, of thinking. Uh, we've been using AFM to probe the mechanical properties of these organelles. They're essentially mechanical responsive as well as you can imagine. Uh, we know less about, about the details of how the crowding particular cytoplasm is, is altering the properties of the epidermis itself. But when we do experiments in vitro with granules that we would expect to have different viscosity, we see different, uh, we, we see different mechanical responses of the cells. And so you say have a, a, a low viscosity compartment versus a high viscosity, viscosity compartment. And you begin to see the cats, of course, going there as well. So you get reinforcement of those regions of the cell. And we can see that by AFM in cell culture. The prediction is that that translates to the epidermis. And I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that it probably does, but we don't have data to show that. Um, so I do think that it's really important to think about it, especially because the skin has remarkable elastic properties that, uh, that need to be controlled and are probably related to the structure of the cytoplasm. So it's things that we need to think about more, but at least the evidence that we have, we can think of these membranous organelles as mechanically responsive. And so they do play an important role, I think. Great, thank you. So, Ao Fen Zeng asks, I am a freshman in college, so a lot of this is very new, but interesting to me. I'm interested in the medical or practical applications of synthetic 
uh, of creating synthetic membraneless organelles. He wants to know a little bit about the, those applications. Yeah, that's as if, I mean, it, it depends. It's certainly a fundamental question. It depends on the biological system, um, many, many different kinds of applications. In the context of the skin, as I alluded to towards the end, our major driving uh, force is that these mutations in the major scaffold that forms these compartments in, in the skin is heavily mutated. And so particularly in Asians and uh, Northern Europeans, these mutations do create a lot of trouble. They essentially prevent assembly of these organelles and they're known to be linked to things like ectopodermatitis and in some cases, psoriasis. And so what we're interested in is, can we create synthetic organelles that would rescue those skin barrier defects, right? They're lacking these organelles. Can we create a system that would rescue that? We know that it's hard to do it with endogenous protein, as, as I said, because it's so large. Technically speaking, it's almost impossible to work with such gigantic proteins. You, there's no way to deliver them. So we think that by shrinking them, but it's still recapitulating the formation of those organelles, we might have a shot at rescuing or sort of curing those disorders. In fact, the therapies that exist out there to treat those disorders are palliative in nature. What you're doing is you're dealing with the, with the barrier defect by dumping down inflammation. So immunosuppressive uh, strategies. What we think is possible now is to rescue the underlying barrier defect, which is rooted in the lack of these organelles. So I, at least in the context of the skin, there's a clear application. And there's fascinating stuff in the context of neurodegeneration. So as a freshman, uh, I encourage you to look at neurodegeneration. There's beautiful, beautiful opportunities for, for work in that space as well. All right, thank you. Another question is related to the experiments uh, about uh, the dis dis disassembly of, dis of uh, granules within pH. When you change the pH gradient to disassemble these stress granules, uh, can you have a fully disassembly or there is a degree of hysteresis? Oh, that, that's, that's a really good question. So you may have noticed from the images, when you shift that pH, uh, it's basically impossible in our system to complete this assembly with pH. The reason for that is that you essentially have millimolar amounts of a pH buffer. And so even though you get, you get to trigger the initial stages of this assembly and there are changes in phase pressure dynamics, over time, there is pH buffering that happens. And so we've seen this in different, in different ways as pH reporters. So we think that what's going on in reality is that the pH trigger is the initial stage of this assembly that changes the permeability of the, of the organelles and allows for other components to enter like enzymes that add PTMs, post-sonal channel modifications that complete this assembly. So we think actually pH is not sufficient, which is a, it's a great catch, but that it, the changes in permeability then now enable the later stages of this assembly, which probably uh, we think involve PTMs and we've done some work in that space. Uh, we have implicated phosphorylation particularly. So the kinases, we don't know who they are, but we know phosphorylation is a potent way to complete this assembly. Now Thank history you. is uh, it's a whole different topic. I don't even want to go there. Thank you. All right, a couple of last questions. Idira Macias asked, uh, great work. You mentioned that the release of components is important for nucleation. What components are these and how do you, uh, how do the compartments change? Uh, so yeah, unfortunately we don't, we don't really know because we haven't gotten the proximity of epidemics data yet. Um, but you can imagine things like nucleases, right? We, need, we know that the chromatin needs to be cleaved um, and so we think that most likely there are nucleases that DNAs, for example, that are trapped in the condensates that they might be released in a pH responsive manner to accelerate the process of enucleation and chromatin cleavage. But we don't really know. And so what we're doing is with the strategy that I show you where we can biotinylate the components of, the, of, the gra of, of, of these granules, what you can do now is you can break the, the skin, you can lyse it and just literally pull down on the biotin label proteins and in that way, uh, build them up of who those components are. And so we think that this biotinylation strategy, uh, which you know, I sort of presented more from the perspective of, hey, proof of concept that you can restrict reactions. In reality for us, is a major strategy to then answer the question that you asked, which is, hey, who are those components? But we suspect that nucleases uh, and, other, um, and other proteases as well are probably implicated. Thank you. And uh, last question from Jack Holland. Do you know if the Kg caging by keratin is ubiquitous among, amongst the higher organism? And do you know if the KGs co-evolve within the keratin network? That's a really cool question. And, and for the most part, I don't really have a good answer to it. 
Um, the evolution of a lot of these sequences is pretty hard to track because they're very low complexity uh, and they evolve very, very rapidly. And I don't really have a good handle of how these IDP domains in keratins particularly evolve. I can tell you one thing, however, the keratin family is very large. You know, there are 70, you know, something really dozens and dozens of keratins. And there is a lot of variability, particularly in the IDP domains. As I said, they, they evolve rapidly. And so even for the epidermis, in the melanin epidermis, we don't have to go very far. If you compare the keratins that are found in the basal, so the stem cells at the very bottom, those keratins are different than the ones in the granule layer. And they're different mostly at those IDP regions. And so, um, you know, we know that they're specific. So there's probably some sort of coevolution, I guess, in that sense. They're really kind of answering specifically to the interaction that you need with those keratin, uh, between keratins and filigrins. But I wouldn't go as far as, as, as maybe thinking beyond mammalians. But at least in the context of the epidermis, there is a lot of specificity to these IDPs that are basically interacting with the, with the granules in a way that we don't see for our keratin. So we do think that is some sort of interesting interaction coevolution there, but not in the context of like, you know, historical evolution, but particularly in the context of the epidermis, there is definitely keratin specific domains that we think are the ones that are interacting with the granules. Thank you. And the really last one, the student just followed up with the question about pH. Have you tried other external stimuli, assembly, disassembly besides pH? Oh, that's a cool question. So that's a great question because uh, I focus on pH, but uh, because a lot of the biology that we've done really has to do with pH, we think it's an essential. It was actually unknown. We, we kind of uncovered that new pH transition, pH shift was unknown. So we kind of uncovered that. It was a, it's a pretty cool observation that was inspired by our work uh, with phase separation and membranous organelles. But you can imagine the skin is beautiful because the skin is, is kind of the exciting example where although we typically think of cells as being homeothermic, Maybe that not, that's not so true for the epidermis, right? The epidermis is the interface with the environment. These organelles may be experiencing a bunch of different interesting environments. And so we think a lot about temperature. And we know temperature is a potent modulator of these phase separation dynamics. We've done a lot of experiments in the past and even in the, in the context of keratolan and granules. And although we don't really know how temperature particularly contributes to the biology, I can tell you that the viscosity is shifted dramatically by temperature. And so we've done experiments where we subject these granules in the cell to different temperatures and we see the shifting of the viscosity. So of course you can get, basically if you cool down, these are uh, polymers that respond permanently to low temperatures. If you go from 32 Celsius to 15 Celsius, that permanently gels kind of takes the, the granules to a gel-like state. And so we're very intrigued to explore how this shifting of the material properties in a pH dependent, in a temperature dependent manner might be contributing to skin biology. Because in fact, people with skin barrier disorders suffer a ton when they go to cold environments. And so there's a lot of interesting implications with other, other stimuli beyond pH, and we're definitely interested in exploring those. And, and the skin is a beautiful system to do that. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiros. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very, very, very interesting. So we're gonna move thank on you. to our next speaker. And I'm gonna share my screen. All right. Uh, the next speaker for today is uh, Cesar Rodriguez Emenegger. All right. Uh, Cesar leads his research group at the Leibniz Institute for Interactive Materials and his research focus on synthetic strategies to generate materials able to adapt and interact with living matter. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez Emenegger, please uh, feel free to share your screen and start whenever you're ready. Right. Can you see my screen now? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. Now, okay, yes. Now. Yes. Perfect. So thank you <clears throat> very, very much for inviting me to this talk. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Emenegger and I lead a group on bioactive interface in the Leibniz Institute in Aachen. These are the very talented young scientists working together with me. And the main mission of my group is to design synthetic materials, protocells that are able to communicate with living matter and in a way dictate how this living matter has to behave. Now, typical examples that on what we work with are examples that are connected with medical applications. Like for example, to design cells that are able, synthetic cells that are able to eat up a bacterium and protect us against infections, for example, in orthopedic implants or on gun dressings. Here you can see in red, a synthetic cell eating up 
a living Escherichia coli. This is the very first example of non-living matter eating living matter. But we want to have the synthetic cells to be able to actually be able to tell apart between different bacteria, whether this is pathogenic or not pathogenic, and decide in a pre-programmed manner. And for that, we need highly specific interaction at the level of the cell membrane. Now, when we look at biology, we know that the interfaces in biology, they are incredibly selective, and they are able to differentiate between objects that are very much alike. In spite of having them at a very low concentration, very often, just relying on a very large binding constant and the repellency to the other objects, which is a very difficult task, because if you think always in aqueous systems, you have attractive interactions. Now, how can we bring that together? Professor Frankel put forward the concept of super selectivity. In simple words, what it says is, if at the bio interface, we increase the number of receptors, we are going to have a super linear response on the binding. This is a super selective interface. But when we go below a certain threshold of bioreceptors, we don't observe any binding at all. And this is such a powerful concept. Just imagine to be able to tell apart between healthy and diseased cells just by the density of receptors that they have on their surface. Now, this concept was further um, developed by Battaglia that find out that by increasing to a higher level the density of receptors, we could lead to a basically repulsive interactions and have no binding at all. So, and he termed this range selectivity. Now, the question is how can we develop interfaces that can do this and maintain us in this sweet spot where super selectivity is present? And our approach or our concept is basically to climb these stairs. First, we need to have an interface, a cell membrane that is completely repellent to all interaction except the desired ones. Then we want to introduce receptors that can very specifically bind the molecules that we want. But these interactions must be in the order of the thermal energy, so extremely weak so that this will allow that the system is reversible and that the binding can be perfected. But if we want to work with such low adhesion energies, we need to work with many of these at the same time. This is basically the principle of multivalency. Then we would like that the receptors can move. <clears throat> Why? Because at the binding site, the receptors are basically, when they bind from a thermodynamic point of view, they are depleted. So now new receptors will migrate to the binding site in order to equalize the chemical potential, and that would lead to an overall higher binding. And last but not least, I would like to be able to pre-organize the binding sites so that when binding occurs, there is a smaller loss of entropy compared to the non-pre-organized systems. And in that case, it will be thermodynamically more favorable. Now, putting all these steps together, we believe that we will be able to achieve super selectivity. Now, first things first, we need first to design the membrane. And we want to do that by utilizing synthetic amphiphiles by their self-assembly together with existing natural receptors, because the natural receptors, their function has been optimized by nature over millennia. There is nothing better than that. But there is a catch here. Now, natural receptors are made to fit in cell membranes that have exactly five to six nanometers thick. So if we want to co-assemble them with our synthetic cell membranes, we must make our membranes also only five to six nanometers thick. Also, we would like to emulate the extreme flexibility of cell membranes that is flexible just by the thermal energy. But now imagine you want to make a synthetic cell that is several micrometers in diameter, only five nanometers thick and extremely flexible. How do we keep that stable? And this is a major challenge for synthetic cells. Then we would like to introduce high lateral mobility so that these receptors can move across the membrane and even organize. Now we need the dynamics. Now, of course, the first thing that come to our mind is why don't we use lipids? They're the main components of the cell membrane. But the self-assembly of lipids into liposome lacks sufficient stability for the advanced functions for what we would like to use them. And this is going to be the last time you're going to listen to me talking about lipids. 
Now, polymer claim is solved this problem of instability by introducing other type of amphiphile called amphiphil um, amphiphilic block of polymers. In water, they self-assemble into vesicles, which are called polymersomes, where the stability increases with the size of these macromolecules. Now, but this comes at a cost. Increasing the molecular weight increases the sickness well beyond the biomimetic sickness. And moreover, these hydrophobic domains, the chains are all entangled. Now, the dynamic of such systems are much lower than the dynamics of the lipid membranes. And the flexibility is completely different. So we need new concepts for synthetic cell membranes that are modular and can allow us to recapitulate the properties in spite of not being lipids. And our group got inspiration of these two great scientists. Birchel is the pioneer in the use of Janus dendrimers for biomimetic vesicles. And Professor Ringsdorf has opened the field of using amphiphilic compolymers for the self-assembly onto biomimetic vesicles. Now, how these systems look like? They contain hydrophilic domains, shown in the sky blue, and hydrophobic domains. In water, they self-assemble into vesicles that are called dendrimersomes or combisomes, which amalgamate the high stability of conventional polymersomes with the biomimetic sickness, flexibility, and lateral mobility of liposomes. They really bring the very best of the two worlds. Now, because these molecules are synthetic and the synthesis is completely modular, we can do whatever we want with them, including program the properties at the mesoscopic level into the molecular level. For example, the Janus dendrimers consist of hydrophobic and hydrophilic dendrons that are attached to the core. The hydrophobic dendron controls the sickness of the membrane, the flexibility, and the stability. Now, the hydrophilic dendron basically controls the interaction with the outside. Will the vesicle be invisible or will it interact? All these things can be programmed. In the case of the amphiphilic compolymers, they consist of a hydrophilic backbone. For example, chemically, it can be a polyvinylamide or also acrylamide, to which we append alkyl chains. These alkyl chains are mimics of the tails of phospholipids. Now, by controlling the density of these alkyl chains, we control the way they will self-assemble. And by controlling the length, we control the thickness and also the strength of the interaction. So it's extremely simple systems. Anybody can synthesize them. And once you self-assemble them and form the vesicles, you see, for example, here on the left, is a giant unilaminar vesicle deposit on mica, where we show that the thickness is perfectly biomimetic. You can make them small and you can make them extremely flexible, like the one shown on the right but we can make far more flexible than this. Now, if we change the concept and we introduce the alkyl chains via Coulombic interactions, which are almost as strong as covalent bonds, we have a huge advantage because now the backbone can slip over the alkyl chains. And at the mesoscopic level, this can introduce much higher flexibility. Now you see these two type of vesicles with different densities of alkyl chains demonstrating the very high flexibility that they have. And they are stable up to 60 degrees, something that would not work with, um, with liposomes. They are completely biomimetic. And because of that, we can co-assemble with natural components like lipids. The vesicle on the right is fluorescently labeled by the self-assembly with a fluorescently labeled lipid. We can also introduce peptides and transmembrane proteins, like in this case, we have here a vesicle which contains calcine and a spike in a nanomolar concentration of alpha hemolysin, which is, which is a pept poor forming peptide. The peptide insert into the membrane can move thanks to the very high lateral mobility, assemble forming a pore through which cobalt ions enter and quench the calcine, demonstrating the, the dynamics of the membrane on one hand and also the stability. We can create pores without blowing up the cell. Now, in this slide, we try to, to demonstrate the dynamics of the system. This we basically measure by FRAP, the diffusion coefficient of the different systems that we have, the compolymers and the dendrimers, and we compare to phospholipids and polymersomes. And as you can see, our systems are very close to 
the dynamics of phospholipids, but they are one to two order of magnitude faster than those of polymersons. Now, once we have the framework structure, we need to start introducing the properties. The first is we need to turn the membrane stale so that then we can introduce the receptors. To do that, we follow two concepts. In the first concept, we introduce a static repulsion by introducing some of the dendrimers to have longer polymeric arms so that they can prevent the absorption of macromolecules and cells. In the second concept, we introduce cosmotropic group betaines that in strongly interact with water and in that way prohibit the interaction with surrounding proteins. These are the first example of sweeter ionic Janus dendrimers that they self-assemble into vesicles with biomimetic sickness and that they are sterile. In a similar, in a similar manner, we can also make it with cone polymers by growing polymers by control radical polymerization based on this monomer here, this is a carboxy betaine that generate an interface having this cosmotropic group and we co-polymerize it with this monomer here that allows the introduction of the alkyl change by ionic interaction, giving rise to stale properties and extreme flexibility. Now, how are we going to introduce the selectivity? Well, at the beginning, I started with an example of our interest of interacting with bacteria. So many pat pathogenic bacteria have lectins on their surface and they use this lectin to attack, to bind to sugars on cells and attack them. So we want to use now that mechanism to generate our synthetic cells that can kill bacteria. But first we decorate our synthetic cells with, with different type of glycans. And we want to answer the following question. Does the two-dimensional organization or display of the sugar play a role on the affinity, on the binding strengths? And to, to do that, we decorate our vesicles with glycans and we measure the reactivity towards a lectin, concanavalin A in this case. We synthesize these molecules, these are Janus dendrimers. And as you can see, the molecules on the left Every single branch contains a mannose residue. When we move towards the right, we, are di we dilute these sugar residues with oligotylene oxide. Once we have the molecules, we form vesicles of only one of these components, and we measure the, binding, the, the thermodynamic binding constants to concanavalin A. Much to our surprise, what, what we obtained was that those membranes where sugar was completely crowded at the surface, have the lowest thermodynamic binding constant, and those that were diluted have the highest. Why that could be? We decided to look at the membrane, and what we observed was that at the very high density of sugars, the membrane was completely boring and dull, or was completely flat, as you can see here in the AFM figures. But increasing the dilution, which allows these sugars to associate and generate nanoarrays, in some cases lamellar type of arrays, and in some cases hexagonal type of arrays. Now, the question that we need to answer is whether these arrays are actually the cause of the higher reactivity. When we look at the, at the thermodynamic constant, what we observe is that the ones with higher reactivity were those with arrays, and the ones with lower were the ones without the arrays. Is it because of an aesthetic hindrance? that we release by dilution, or is it because of the presence of the array? When we look at literature, similar dilutions yield thermodynamic constant as low as the ones that we have for the, the lowest reactivity system. So it doesn't seem to be actually an aesthetic process. Then we decided to look at the kinetics of the process. And in orange, you see the dissociation kinetic constant, and in green, the association constant. Well, the dissociation constant remains for all the systems more or less the same, but the binding constant, the kinetic binding constant, is the one that drastically increases from the known pattern to the pattern one. And when uh, indeed suggesting that this is connected with the during the binding process. And so if we look at the molecular dimensions of the concanavalin A, it seems that the binding domains have the same spacing 
that the space entered with machinery with our nano arrays, which basically suggested the nano arrays are responsible for the higher reactivity. Now we would like to bring these higher reactivity systems to localized places in space in micro domains, like the lipid raft. Why this is important? Because we can generate high reactivity in one place and exploit it for particular systems. Here you see a nice micro domain form basically with the higher reactivity sugars. And we want to basically utilize it to have a way to facilitate engulfment. If the bacterium binds one of these rough like domains, now we will generate a non-zero curvature that will generate a torque which will facilitate the engulfment. And basically that relay domain will be a better place to eat up bacteria from our synthetic cells. I would like to close my lecture saying that our goal is to design synthetic cells that where we can program all the properties like the sickness, the flexibility, stability in the molecular structure, utilize them to generate self-regulated systems, for example, antimicrobials, to probe biological questions. And at a later stage, we want to integrate cell machinery to have systems that are come closer and closer to life. And one of the, the key questions that we want to address is if we can perform cell division, like by introducing the bacterial division. And we, this is our last work in collaboration with Petra Schwiele, where we were able to integrate the mean D and E system that helped to position the set ring right in the middle of the synthetic cell. This is the first example of being, of being able to introduce such biological system in a fully synthetic vesicle. And these are the first examples towards the formation of the set ring. You see here the fibers that bundle towards the formation of the set ring. I would like to thank all of you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, Cesar. It was a very, very nice talk. I have a couple of questions from the audience. First of all, Jacqueline Delora as says, amazing work, Cesar. Have you thought about functionalizing the synthetic membranes with, for example, membrane spanning proteins that are responsible for mechanical interactions or adhesions with natural cells? and how mechanically stable are your architectures? This is an excellent question. In particular, the exact proteins that Jacqueline mentioned, we have not used them, but we, we are working on basically using this, uh, different type of proteins fused to our system so that we can insert it in the membrane and then have the reactivity outside. That's include enzymes and include binding domains and so on, but we would be happy to, to try something new if, if Jacqueline has the interest. Thank you. Uh, Felipe Giros says, beautiful work, Cesar. I'm curious about Thank the you. stability and response of your polymeric structure to physiological buffers, for example, salt, especially for those that exploit ionic interactions like ionic combinomes. Right, this is, this is in fact a, um, a very important question. Whenever you will change the osmotic pressure outside on the system that is very flexible, you are going to have all type of shape transformation regardless of the stability. Now, uh, if we want to have them in buffer, <clears throat> we prepare them in the same buffer so that we maintain the osmolarity. And we have assembled them on different type of, of buffers in particular, then when we want to have proteins outside. Increasing the, increasing the, the ion concentration outside up to a certain level, then we start having problems with the ionically linked vesicles. But in the range on, of the physiological conditions, our vesicles are stable. And uh, answering following, uh, if the vesicles would be unstable, they would probably have some sort of toxic effect. We can incubate them with different fibroblasts and, and cells of the, um, basically, the respiratory tract, and we don't observe any toxicity. Thank you. And Gabriel Lopez says, thank you for sharing your great work. The word selectivity implies preference for one binder over another. Have you conducted such studies? 
Yes. Uh, it's not something that I had had the time, but we we target different type of, of objects, not only bacteria. And for that, we introduce very specific, um, very specific partnering molecules on the other object. Um, I'm afraid that I cannot go to details on that, but uh, it allows us to, for example, distinguish between two objects by the decoration that we have on the surface. And the type of ligands that we utilize for that, they are not sugars in that case. They are, for example, DNA aptamers or even small proteins and nanobodies. Thank you. Uh, Idira Macias asks, what is the yield of the cell membrane when you tune the molecular structure to control its properties? How monodispersed are they? And what are the methods used to form these membranes? All right. So the, the monodispersity, it, um, the, the membranes are absolutely monodispersed in the thickness because this is what is controlled thermodynamically. The diameter of the vesicles, it can be anything you wish, and it only depends on the, on the way on how you, you, you make them. So if you utilize a method like, for example, synfin rehydration, or, the, um, or electroformation, you're going to form them as giant unilamellar vesicles. And there will be a, a variability in the diameter. If you utilize microfluidics, something that we still have not done, but is possible, you will have them uh, basically very, with, uh, with very low dispersity in the diameter. When you utilize um, another method like injection method where you have a solution of your polymer or your dendrimer and you, inj and you inject it into water, the solvent must be miscible with water. Then you, you basically what you get is an spinodal decomposition. And then the, the, the distribution of diameters is very small but I would not dare to say that it's monodispersed. All right. Uh, Time, thanks for your great talk. For your last slide, I am just wondering how the liposomes forms in liposome. Can the liposome divide by itself? Uh, so you, you, can, you can make multilamellar vesicles but they are not going to divide by themselves unless you have a trigger. So you in in this in actually in this slide that you see here, you see some cells that are basically. Uh, if I can go back and forward, you see a lot of well my my slide block, but you can trigger the shape transformation in a very easy manner. So if you design molecules that are in principle cylindrical, they fit wonderfully in a bilayer. If a small proportion of them now can change the shape, their topology, you create basically a, a molecule that does not really like to be on the membrane. They come together, they generate um, non-zero curvature, and you can drive process of shape transformation, including tubulation, formation of daughter vesicles, and even control the formation of nuclear, of pores that are very similar to the nuclear pores that you see in, in natural cells. But you need an external stimuli or to program the molecules to change because of this stimuli. Thank you. Um, that was it for today, Dr. Rodriguez Menegra. Thank you very much for your talk. My pleasure. Uh, Thank you for all the attendees to assist for to these two amazing talks. Thank you, Dr. Kiras, again. Uh, remember, we'll see you next week, April 19th, at the same time, for two talks, one from Philip Bastien from Max Planck Institute, uh, and then Zachary Manger from Cornell University. Uh, thank you very much for attending, and see you next week.